This episode of the Accounting Insiders Podcast is brought to you in part by Zero. Zero is a powerful cloud accounting software that improves efficiencies across your practice. With all client data stored on a single unified ledger, you and your clients can easily access and collaborate on the same set of books. Zero's advisor tools and automation solutions reduce time-consuming manual tasks and put data entry on autopilot. Work faster and more efficiently than ever before with Zero. Visit zero.com slash accounting insiders to learn more. Hello and good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Accounting Insiders Podcast. My name is Gary Dehart. I am the publisher of Insightful Accountant and Tax Practice News, as well as the host of Accounting Insiders Podcast. My guest today is John Briggs, CPA. Let me make sure I get this right. CPA, author, CEO, founder of Insight Tax. Welcome, John. Thanks for having me, Gary. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is Friday afternoon on a three-day weekend, so uh, we're going to keep it short and simple and concise, I hope, which is hard for me to do sometimes. But uh, so let me just dive right in. So how long have you been, how long, when did you found Insight Tax? Uh, Found Insight Tax back in 2012. Okay. And your background is tax and accounting? Yeah, I have a master's degree in tax. Yeah. That sounds like Something awesome, I would right? never, ever want <laughs> to be associated with. So yeah, so glad there are people like you who, who can handle the tax code for those of us who don't want to deal with it. So um, but in, so in addition to tax, you've got one book that's already out there and one that you're working on. So the book that is already out there is Profit First for Micro Gems. So is Insight, are you fairly uh, niche in that business or in that practice? Yeah, we do a lot of marketing specifically to gym owners. Um, okay. We have more gym clients than any other accounting firm in the U.S. So I would say we're pretty niche there. They do only represent about 15 to 20 percent of our total business, though. OK. And did, did you fall into that or was that a strategic decision of, hey, here's a whole you know, thousands of businesses that probably don't get very good representation? Yeah. So I read a book called The Pumpkin Plan by Mike Michalowicz. Oh, yeah. I've got it. Right here. Yeah, right. Mike, um, he's great. And with all of his books, he always gives practical application. So a quick synopsis for listeners, the pumpkin plan basically is saying, hey, look how these farmers grow a thousand pound pumpkins. You can take the same process and apply it in your business by choosing a niche, right? The thousand pound pumpkin is a niche because they plant the seed and then they like focus on the one pumpkin that's growing a lot and then they weed like crazy and just focus on that um so i love the analogy and then i went through his exercises and as part of that you try to identify which clients pay you a good amount like you like how they pay you they're fun to work with they're coachable Uh, because even if we're bookkeepers or tax we still need clients to be coachable right (laughs) even if it's can you tell me what this transaction is so i can update your books um And so we did that. And I realized at the time we had about 20 clients who were gym owners and we really enjoyed working with them. They knew they didn't know tax. So they didn't question us. They didn't like always push back when we gave them suggestions on what they should do. And we're like, okay, let's, let's do this. Now, to be fair, let's do this to actually doing it probably took about three or four months of getting over the fear, right? Because a lot of times when we think about niching the fear as a business owner for me was, but I don't want to say no to other people. Right. Like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know. Cause you know, in the U S there's only 77,000 micro gyms. <laughs> I mean, what's going to happen is like, well, okay, well, I don't have 77,000 clients now as a firm. So we're probably okay. Um, and then the reality is as you market specifically to a niche, other people still resonate with the message. Um, so the pumpkin plan, getting over my fear, And then we just really went hard on the marketing stuff. And that led to um, writing the Profit First for Micro Gyms, which is a derivative book of the original Profit First that Mike McCullough also wrote. Right. And so did, um, tell me one more time again, how you actually got like that first client. I mean, was it, hey, I love going to the gym and I know these guys need help or? Um, So for me, I had a client who provided website and business coaching services to gym owners. Okay. And he was so impressed with the services we did. He said, hey, would you be interested 
um, and giving my clients like a 30 minute free session about their taxes. And so for me, I like education marketing, just provide a lot of content. You'll have enough people who will end up using your services. So I'm like, you're going to, you're going to give me people to talk to in right. front. Like, okay. Yeah. And my, our close ratio is like 75% on those, on those meetings. Um, that's so that's kind of how that happened. But the, anyone at this point in time could look at their current client list and do the same exercise and just be like, you know, is it a crush or cringe factors? How Mike calls it. Do I really like it when they call me or when they call me, am I like, Oh, I don't want to pick up the phone. Right. And so the ones you enjoy working with, make a group of those, then compare how much are, are they paying you? You, you know, the higher profitable clients are better to focus on. And then is there any commonality between them? That mm -hmm. could easily become a way to find a niche pretty easily. Okay. No, that's great. The, uh, and I guess the other way is, you know, maybe you just have a passion for a market, right? And it's like, you know, I love working with restaurant owners and which I'm not sure how many people actually ever say that because I'm, I'm, that's got to be difficult. Just their businesses are, are so yeah. complex, it seems. That's a hard uh, one. But yeah, totally. They could just, if you have a passion for it, the the key for me in growing the niche was finding um, comparable, not comparable, what's the word? They're not competitors to you, but they, your services complement what they're doing. Okay. Um, so they have a list of clients in your niche. You go in, work out it like, hey, let me serve your audience as well. What does that look like? Like for us as accountants, as bookkeepers, you'd be surprised how many people are open to I, the idea of, if you just provide some education for my clients, I'm happy to expose you to them because they need your stuff, right? Any other industry, tax and accounting is always a need for everybody. And right. often when I go on podcasts or these special mastermind groups, it's like, well, you're the first one we've had, you know, in three years on the show who's talking about numbers. <laughs> like we have, they they want what we have to offer. It's not that hard for them to see the value we offer. You just have to kind of put yourself out there and say, hey, let's let's do something together. Right. Well, so let's move conversation from niche because I'm all in with you on niche. It's um, I think, you know, it probably also helps you become a true expert in that space. Right. Because, you know, I imagine gyms probably have some things that restaurants don't like right, from a tax perspective or from an accounting perspective. So, you know, each business can run differently. So if um, so speaking of businesses running differently and kind of our pre uh, discussion your business it does run differently than than many tax and accounting firms. So you said you don't have partners; they're really licensees. So explain that and how that um, how that helps reach a goal that you're trying to reach. I'm going to bring this bring this in now, which is really the kind of impact change across the profession that allows people to have a life. I guess is the, the short way to put it. But so just tell a little bit about what that arrangement looks like in your business. And how it impacts you know the people who you work with. Yeah, so I never loved the idea when I did a little stint at Deloitte. I didn't love the idea of this. Hey, put in your time, pay your dues, basically suffer for a really long time, and then we'll make you partner. And then that's the like the end all be all holy grail. Like, yeah, I got partner. Well, studies show that when you make partner, nothing actually changes. You just make more money. You're still working a crazy amount of hours. Plus, I also didn't like this idea of, yeah, but if I can create value now, I'm doing a good job now. Why wouldn't you reward me now? Like what right. I'm giving you value, let's exchange back. Um, so that's a philosophy we've built into our company. If a professional is capable of doing good work, they communicate well with a client, we do our best to help our accountants not speak like accountants. Right. Um, and then as long, and then they're organized. If they can do those things, we say, okay, here's what we'd like to do. We basically, we want to make you a partner, but only in your client base. So they become that partner. They effectively license the back end that we've created. So they use all of our systems. We send them clients and their only responsibility is to make sure the client's taken care of. Um, and we build in because they now have ownership in their client base, that becomes an asset that they can sell instead of staying at W2 forever. It's like, great, I want, I'm ready to retire. I don't have anything to sell for all these hard work I've been doing. We give them that option too. And so 
our our whole firm averaged 42.6 hours a week during tax season. Um, we have nine licensees and all of them make more than six figures. We have a few in the 300 to $400,000 range. And they just, they basically get the benefits of being an owner without the headache. Well, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, and are they all CPAs or EA? They're not all CPAs, but they, they need to be a CPA or an EA if they're doing tax. Right. We have a couple who are bookkeeping only licensees. Okay. And so we don't, we don't require them to get a CPA or an EA, but if they're going to do tax, they have to have one of those certifications because you can't represent the client if you don't have one of those. Sure. Now, like, well, you're the ones who are the bookkeeping folks, do they end up partnering up with the tax and accounting licensees? Or how yeah. That... So we split like, so if a client comes in and they say, Hey, I want to do bookkeeping and tax. Well, the tax invoice gets assigned to the tax licensee. The bookkeeping invoice gets assigned to the bookkeeping licensee. Right. And then it, it's really great because they're both part of the same company. They both speak the same language. They culturally know what we're trying to accomplish. And it does it does work out really well. That sounds great. Is anybody else structured like that? Any other firms that you're aware of? Not, no, not the way we're structured. And then um, we did touch kind of in our pre-talk just on kind of the tech stack. Um Having a centralized tech stack, or or at least having everybody on the same systems, right? I'm sure sure gives a good base for you to be able to do that efficiently and effectively, as well as you know connecting with customers. What what does that look like? Like what's in that tech stack currently? Yeah, so we um, we use Salesforce for our CRM, and that allows us to automate a lot of stuff. So like when a client comes in. We want to help them avoid buyer's remorse. A lot of times in any purchase, let alone services, uh, there's like kind of an emotional roller coaster that our clients go through. Yeah. So client gets added, Salesforce automates some emails and some training videos and things to get them like going right away. Um, we use Lacert for our tax software. We have QBO for our bookkeeping clients. Um, we do have a few zero clients as well. And um, then we also use MailChimp for some our newsletter outreach, but quite frankly, where I think we might be outgrowing MailChimp at this point. Uh, those are the main ones that come to mind. Have you had clients or prospects that come in that you guys just end up going, not a good fit? Yeah, almost every day. <laughs> Yeah, it's important for us to interview the client as much as them interviewing us, for sure. You got to know, like, we're all flavors, different flavors of ice cream, right? And find the person who wants your flavor. And it's okay if not, like we, uh, you know, we're pretty open. If you look at our website, we're open with IRS sucks. Um, right, we yeah. think so of them very highly. And so that's kind of just our tone. Like, this is who we are. We're pretty casual. We wear jeans and t-shirts to work. If you're looking for a CPA who wears a suit and tie every day. Great. That's good for them. It's not, that's not who we are. So different right. flavor of ice cream. And then do you have like a list of people that you're like, okay, this person, uh, I really don't like this person. I'm going to refer them over to uh, Bob down the street. <laughs> I like this person, but it's not a good fit for us. I'm going to refer them over to John or do you have a good referral network that where you do point um, we don't have a referral network. We usually just fire the client. <laughs> um, Cause usually when we're to the point to fire them, I there's reasons and it's like, sure. you know what? I don't want to, if you end up being this bad for somebody else, I don't want them to be mad at me. <laughs> well, that's fair. Right? <laughs> so have you, have you heard of tax Titans? Tax Titans? No. So um, I've talked about them. Well, I, I actually met them back in December. And then I've talked about them a few times on podcasts over the past couple of three weeks because I actually had him on my podcast. Basically, in a nutshell, he's he's setting up kind of a dating app, if you will, for business owners and for accounting firms where a business owner can go there and go, hey, you know, here's my I need these three. You know, I need taxes done for my business, my personal and my kid. And they can bid that out basically. And then accounting firms can, or tax preparers can say, yeah, I'll do those for X number of dollars. Um, but he's also kind of positioning it as 
look, if you have clients that you need to fire, which is for many people, a very uncomfortable conversation, Sure. then you can just say, look, you're not a good fit for us anymore. Tax Titans over here is a great place for you to, you to go and find the right people. It kind of takes you out of that loop of referring a client that you don't like to somebody who you do like. Uh, like you just said, you're like, I don't want to send that baggage to somebody else. But it's almost, you know, it's it's a way to kind of get them out in in a with a soft touch. And yeah. and he's doing a lot through veterans and actually he's trying to get kind of the tax tax prep into veterans and and actually active duty military spouses because you know in most cases they have time on their hands or they're yeah. working they're working at the Burger King on post, which is you know, in many cases below their education level. And that I'm yeah. not judging by saying that, but in many cases you have a, a CPA who is, you know, gets deployed with their spouse to Germany, right? And what are they going to do? Um, Good for him. That's a smart yeah. idea to market that yeah. way. I, yeah. And he's been around about 14 months. So he's still kind of in the early stages, but I, I everything he says makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and I like, what other things have you seen um, about going back to the impact change on that allows people to have a life. Maybe let's tie in your your three point is it three point three rule? Is that right? Yeah, the three point three rule. Mm -hmm. All right, let's hear it. What's that all about? Well, so if you th <laughs> quick story, there's a, a more of an anecdote. So there's a little girl in the kitchen, and her mom cuts off the ends of the pot roast, and the girl says, "Mom, why did you cut off the ends of the pot roast?" And she, the mother says, I don't know. That's how my mom taught me. So the grandma's there. So they go ask the grandma, why do you cut off the end of the pot roast? And she responds, I don't know. That's how my mom taught me. Just so happens, the great grandma happens to be at the house. So they ask her and she says, well, because our pot roast pan was too small. <laughs> there we go. That's Sometimes, right. like, especially in the accounting industry, but really in the world in general, we do things just because it's been done that way. Right. The eight hour workday is a perfect example of that. There is zero science or studies that support an eight hour workday is the most sufficient and effective workday. It was created. Um, Henry Ford gets a lot of credit for popularizing the eight hour workday because at the time they were working seven days a week, you know, 10, 15 hour shifts. And he said, okay, we're going to shorten the day to eight hours and then we're going to shorten the work week. So it was revolutionary. But he basically did it so that people could have more time leisurely so that they want to buy cars and drive around and use his cars. Um, and again, no science behind it. But if we then look right. at the science of like, how does our attention work? Uh, studies show that the average worker works two hours and 57 minutes during a normal eight hour workday. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we pair that with a study by Alejandro Yeras from the University of Illinois, where he said, look, there are studies that show a physical stimulus that our body will neutralize that attention on as long as if it's constant. So think about our clothes, like the clothes rub on your skin, you can feel the weight of it. But up until this moment, your body forgot that you were technically wearing a shirt because the stimulus was constant. He said, yeah. I wonder, so the study was, I wonder if the same thing happens to our attention span and our focus, ability to focus. And he did some studies and lo and behold, that was the outcome. So the 3.3 rule says the most effective workday is working up to three hours in a work block, followed by a 30% recovery period. So if I worked an hour and a half, at once in one sitting, I would want to take a 30 minute break. That 30% is important because it allows our focus to reset. Um, and it has to be a break. You give yourself permission to take a break. And by doing that, what we find is that I, I now know that I'm going to get a break. So I focus more when I'm working. So instead of working two hours and 57 minutes, I basically have a three hour block of like good work product. I take an hour break off. And then I have another three hour work block. And, I mean, there's varieties to the 3.3. .3, and if you're working an hour, if that's your best attention span, it all works as long as you right. stick to being under three hours. And it helps our team because they know I'm going to be given permission to take a break 
when I don't have to do any work. I don't have to feel guilty. No one's going to give me a hard time when I'm on my break. And that's kind of, that's the gist of it. Okay. And that, um, and that's a book you're working on now. Yeah. I'll be published in October, November ish of 23. Okay. And then what, uh, about how long is it? I, I've never written a book. I've, re- I've edited a couple of them, but never written one. Yeah. I don't know the final page count. We're around mm-hmm. 220 pages. It, it's yeah. a process, right? Yeah, the, I imagine. The crappy first draft and then editing and then having readers read it. And like, I don't know what you're saying here. Like right. clarifying and developmental edits and copy editors and typesetters. It's yeah, it's it's quite the process. Yeah. And then will it go through like if I buy the book, am I going to have kind of a here's step one, two, and three of how you implement this in a in a company or in a firm? Yeah. So there's uh the steps on how to implement the actual rule, and then there's a whole system because what happens is if I'm not familiar with the rule or convinced that it actually works you listen to me and you say, wait, you expect my team to get more done by working less hours. Mm -hmm. Uh, So in order for that to happen, we also lay out a lot of other things they can do to make their business more efficient so that it complements the 3.3 rule really well. Gotcha. Okay. Anything else on that that you want to share? Is there, oh, I do know uh, we probably should share. I saw somewhere because I actually signed up for it um, somewhere on one of your websites or something. There's a place where we can get notified when the book is is uh, published. That's right. The uh, so the website is three three rulebook.com. Okay. And that's where you can get added to the list to no, be notified when the book is out. And it's there's no dot in there, right? It's just there's three, no dots, just three three. Mm-hmm. Number three, number three, rulebook.com. That's right. Okay, great. Um, so let's talk about just before we wind up the kind of biggest struggles that you see since you work in a firm and you've worked at, at a couple of other firms um, and you obviously work with, with numerous small business clients. So what are the biggest struggles, common struggles that you see across most of the businesses you work with? Well, I mean, they, the struggle is money, right? They, uh, our clients who are not accountants, they're just like, man, I need you, but I don't know what I need from you. Mm-hmm. We get into their books. They're disastrous. They have no idea what they're doing. They don't know how much money they're making. We sell them their tax bill. Hey, based on the info you gave us, you owe us this. There's no way I owe that much money. <laughs> you know, we dig into their books and lo and behold, they're classing loans wrong or payables wrong. I mean, our, your audience knows this. That the biggest struggle with them is they just don't have an appeal to spend time to learn about the, their finances and bookkeeping and tax stuff. Right. Um, yeah. And what about with other firm owners? What do you, what do you see as the yeah. bigger? With, a, with accountants, so that bookkeepers, tax people, you know, one of those challenges I want everyone to be aware of is like the amount of abuse you tolerate from your clients. Yeah. Right. Um, we, I bought a firm last year and uh as part of it, two accountants came over and it was, I mean, it's, it takes some retraining and it's, it's almost a reconditioning because they allowed themselves to get to a certain point. You guys know what this looks like. You have a scope for the engagement and the client keeps coming back with more questions. They don't want to pay for the additional ad, like the scope ad, the scope creep, if you will, but they still want the answers. And so a lot of times accountants are uncomfortable with that type of conversation. They think it's a conflict, so they wanna avoid it. When in reality, it's not a conflict. Uh, It's about honoring the value you offer the world. And so getting these two accountants, and I see this with other firm owners, like, look, you gotta respect what you offer the world. Stop discounting your services. Stop mirroring your purchase habits on the client. By meaning sometimes it's like, well, I wouldn't, I personally would never pay $1,000 to get my taxes done. Of course I wouldn't. I'm a CPA. I know how to do it. Right. The client is willing to do that. But just because I'm not willing doesn't mean I should be uncomfortable saying, yeah, it's 1000 bucks. Right. Um, and just like the way clients talk to us, there are more clients out there. You do not have to put up with really mean people. If they're mean, if they're degrading, like you don't have to tolerate it. And a lot of, I mean, I would say, a lot, 50% of the time, 
if a client has something like that, where they just send an email, it's like, dude, you just can't talk to a human that way. Yeah. I'll reply with something to that extent. Like, hey, Bob, I got your email. I just want to let you know it was super inappropriate. Like, you can communicate with me in a way that illustrates what your frustrations may be or what you're hoping for so that I can give you a response. Um, but you can't talk to us this way. So if it's their first warning, it's like, I'll let you choose now if you want to move on. I'm willing to give you a second chance. You know, and half of them are like, oh, you're right. I'm really sorry. I had a bad day. Mm -hmm. and, and and it literally never happens again with those people. Right. Um, and others are like, yeah, go fly a kite. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and that's fine because now you can totally just fine. refer them to tax titans and, uh, and that's right. Fine, right. I got a great place for you to go. Um, yeah, that's it. I, I think that is very hard. I, and I think the key word that you said is the um, conflict. Um, I think the accounting community itself is not, and generally speaking, one that wants to have con and not that most I don't think most people want to have conflict, but it, we don't want it. No, for sure. Yeah, it, but I think it certainly is one that the you know accounting profession avoids at at all costs. And I think the other thing you said, I think too, that ties in really well is about your value. And I think the firm owner or the accountant, bookkeeper, tax person, wh whatever it is, wherever it is that within the profession, they do need to understand what the value is that they bring to the table, and it's immense. And I think most people, I think the bookkeepers especially, undersell themselves and under, undersell their value that they bring because, you know, it's worth a lot of money for me to not have to touch that. And mm -hmm. because it's one, it's not something I enjoy. Two, it's not a strength of mine. Three, I probably won't do it right because I don't like it and it's not a strength of mine. Um, and being able to send that to somebody who I know is going to do it right and get it done right the first time, or if it's wrong, they'll know how to fix it is as a business owner is, you know, that's worth a lot to me. And, and I think if you have clients that don't have that kind of mentality, we go back to what we just said a second ago, time to get new clients because yeah. there are millions of them out there. Who are looking for high quality people to work with. And I totally agree with you. I know there's bookkeepers out there who don't buy it themselves because we'll review a set of books from a potential client and, you know, like, Hey, this is good work. What are they charging you? Oh, they charge me $20 an hour. Oh, okay. Well, we'd give you the same end result, the same quality. And we're 125 an hour, you know, like, mm -hmm. cause we're, we're basically competing against those who are discounted their pricing. Uh, so I, I know that. And, one of the reasons we built the licensee model is because we just hand them new clients because we know that type of conditioning is going to be hard to get through. So it's like, let's, we're just going to remove the temptation that you're going to discount your prices. Someone else is going to sell the client. So when you get them, the contract's already signed, you know, they're paying you what you're worth because we know what you're worth. So we're going to sell what you're worth. Um, so that it that's worked out pretty good for us. And do you have, is everybody there? You're in Utah. Is everybody there in Utah in the same same area? No, we have remote accountants across the country. Okay. Um, and this this isn't for the podcast, but we're talking about it now. Do you know um, uh, Paget? you know, Paget Business Solutions? I Yeah, I've spoken to Scott a couple of times. Okay. Well, I know he has a firm that he's trying to help sell that's in the Atlanta area right now. Oh. Um, so, um, so you might want to reach out to him. Oh, reach out to him. And um, they had an event here in the Atlanta area, which is where I am, that I got that I went to last week and sat down and they mentioned that. They actually have two they're trying to sell. One of them I think might be a little bit more timely that they're trying to trying to move on. Mm. So might be worth reaching out if you've got yeah. room. And so and that's another question. So and we'll wrap up on this just because I know it's uh it's Friday afternoon for me. It's Friday yeah. evening actually almost. So it's time for me to go. Um the what are you seeing from a talent standpoint? I mean, everything we read is, you know, talent's drying up. Nobody wants to be a CPA anymore. Um, how is that impacting your business positively or negatively? Yeah. Um, hiring has been harder for the last couple of years. And I think COVID also accelerated some people's retirement. Mm -hmm. And 
And we know statistically from universities that enrollment in accounting programs is decreasing. Yeah. Uh, there seems to be a general um, decline in the value people put on a CPA, um, which look, I know this isn't a popular opinion, but I can't disagree with them. Like, I mean, I use 10% of what I was tested on for my CPA license. Right. You know, like, why did I need to learn that other stuff? I literally don't ever refer to it ever again. And if I put myself as this prestigious person, when it's basically off-putting to the majority of clients, you know, like, well, I'm not changing my ways. I'm a CPA. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a little bit harder. It's actually why we opened up to hiring remote people. Um, because in our area here, you know, locally, you're you're even more limited. So by having the ability to add remote accountants anywhere, it allows us to expand the pool to find those who still like it. Now we have um we have about 67 team members. And um one of our team members, she basically is our in-house recruiter. So yeah. we're reaching out to accountants on LinkedIn constantly. And these people have jobs. So it's a form of headhunting. Um, because it is, it's it's tough out there. And so most of the people who are really good have a job. Right. Yeah, if they want one. <laughs> and, and I imagine in your area, there's got to be some some pretty major um salary. I don't know if inflation is the right word or not, but um because I mean, because where you are in, in Utah, certainly a lot of tech has gone there, right? So that's had to have driven the yeah, you hit it on the head. We like up. A couple large tech companies have come in. They got the venture capital money. They brought in these accountants and paid them way more money than they should have. And then they downsized their workforce because they were blowing through money. Because, oh, guess what? You didn't have a good team production multiple. You're not earning enough revenue off of what you're paying these guys. And now when they come and interview, like, dude, it's like you've been working at a tech company, looking right. at, you know, not doing actual tax work. Honestly, I can hire a person straight out of college and train them faster, less expensively than you, because I don't have to train you anyways. Like, I can't pay you twice as much. I'm sorry, but sorry. Right. right. Yeah, it's been hard. Yeah, and I'm not sure that there's a whole lot of light, you know, at the end of the tunnel, right? Any that, that that's going to open up at all. doesn't seem like it, uh, which... Yeah leans to the tech stack and the technology and, and bringing, taking everything out of, out of a person's hands that doesn't have to be in there, right? So that they can do more productive work that only they can do. Absolutely. So, and, and there's a lot of great tools out there that, that can do a lot of that. And we just had a two day, we call it future forward summit where we have basically it's two days, four webinars, four sessions a day, virtual. and um, one of the sessions was pretty heavy on automation and kind of my takeaway was just, I need to find the smallest tasks that I can automate, automate that, and then go to the next one. And yeah. Next Great one. strategy. And we have some built in already that we're, that we're using, but I know there's so many things that <clears throat> again, that either I shouldn't be touching or my business partner shouldn't be touching. We have a, an admin that's in the Philippines and, you know, he shouldn't even be touching it because it can be automated. So mm -hmm. we shouldn't touch it at all. So any, uh, anything in closing, anything you want to share in closing? Again, you've got the uh, 33rulebook.com is where your book will be coming out. Profit, profit First for Micro Gems is already out, obviously. And I'm sure that's on Amazon. Amazon, right? yep. Mm -hmm. okay. And then um, are you active on LinkedIn as far as are you posting content out there that people can follow yes. or, or uh -huh. jump on? Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, it's, and that's just John Briggs insight. Um, if they type those three things, they can certainly find you one way or the other. Yep, right? They should find us. Uh -huh. Sorry, I'm losing my voice here. It must be time to end if I've lost my voice. So John, I certainly appreciate, uh, appreciate you taking some time here on uh, Memorial Day weekend and appreciate you again, uh, joining me on the podcast. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks for, thanks for having me, Gary. Absolutely. Talk soon. This episode of the Accounting Insiders podcast is brought to you in part by Wholesale Payroll, the only payroll software built just for you by people just like you. Take the payroll challenge. Visit wholesalepayroll.com 
challenge to learn more.